Thank you all uh, so much for, for having me here. Um, I want to thank the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, all of the sponsors. You know, I'm no stranger to chronic illness, actually, and that's why I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, a few years ago, I was going about my life as if, you know, I was a fitness enthusiast. I was known among my circle and among my friends as someone who never got tired, was the words they would use, and suddenly went out to the Hamptons one weekend, got bit by a tick, got Lyme disease. Um, that led me on quite a journey of, of trying to figure out, you know, what to do about chronic uh, conditions and chronic symptoms that I was having. I recently also had COVID. Uh, I had it, my husband had it, my baby had it, and have some lingering symptoms as a result of that. So, you know, I'm very plugged into chronic illness, chronic illness as it affects women in particular. I'm speaking to women every single week in the news um, who are saying, listen, I'm being labeled as recovered. I don't feel recovered and no one's listening to me. Um, I myself went to many appointments and was not heard, was told, oh, you're stressed. Oh, you're just tired. Oh, you have a lot of responsibilities when I in fact knew my body and knew that something physical was very, very wrong and needed to be addressed. So we have an amazing panel here today. I'm so excited to hear from not only uh, doctors, sociologists, but people who are actually suffering with ME-CFS. And as I came to learn, I didn't know when I first saw the name ME-CFS, I didn't know what that was, but I do know chronic fatigue syndrome. And that is what it was called for many years. I had many people I knew who suffered with chronic fatigue syndrome and found no answers, suffering with debilitating disease, couldn't get out of bed, couldn't do their jobs, couldn't uh, you know, walk to the to the kitchens to prepare dinner for for themselves or their families. Uh, symptoms: brain fog, pain. Um, the idea that you exercise and then you suffer as a consequence and feel ten times worse is horrible. It's horrible to go through that physically and mentally. So, and migraines. Um, you know, I was very naive about migraines for a long time and thought, oh, that must just be a headache. It's not, as as you know much better than I do, but I now know that can be ten to fifteen days a month where you're sitting and you are suffering and cannot lift your head up. Um, that is completely debilitating. So what I would, would love to hear today, and I know we're gonna hear a lot of today, are links to COVID. We're in a very unique time right now where we are in the midst of a global pandemic. So how is MECFS, how, how could people who have MECFS be affected by COVID? How could COVID then become a contributing factor to make people who already have that disease feel worse? And how do we make sure everyone who is suffering as a result of COVID and MECFS complications that may go hand in hand, make sure that they get the care that they need. Um, I know there's a disproportionate impact on women and I, I wanna hear, and I know we will hear why that could be the case. Um, when you hear stats like women are three times more likely to develop prolonged COVID-19, two to three times more likely to develop migraine, three to four times more likely to develop MECFS, that's startling, those numbers. So there's a need to delve into that. Um, and I hear many stories every week of women saying that they go to the doctor and they don't feel heard. They're talking about these symptoms and they don't feel heard. So why is that? Is there some sort of implicit gender bias that's going on that is inhibiting not only the proper diagnosis of these conditions, but the proper, proper treatment of these conditions, particularly for women and for women of color. And we're gonna get into racial bias as well and how that comes into play um, and how that has potentially come into play for people on the panel who've been battling with these conditions and because of implicit racial, racial bias in our system and in the system at large have been unable to get the proper care that they need. Um, also, we always think in terms of the economy, when you have stats like 69% of people with MECFS are unemployed, up to 89% lost their job as a result of it, you have to not only look at the physical and emotional effects of that on a person who is very capable, who wants to contribute, who wants to put food on the table for their family, who has interests and worked very hard for many years to build up uh, really dynamic careers and suddenly, can't do what, what they wanna do so badly. And what is that ripple effect on the economy at large? What does that do? Is that enough of an impetus for people to take this more seriously and come to the table and say, we need solutions, we need funding. Speaking of funding, we're gonna talk about legislation, funding from the NIH, what is happening, what's not happening, what needs to happen. Um, and although this conversation should have happened years ago because so many people are suffering for so long, we now do have COVID-19 in the, in the front of the news cycle every day. And this is an opportunity to say, listen, this COVID-19 is, is important. It is significant. People are dying, but there are also a whole host of people that have been suffering for a really, really long time. And there's a, lo a lot of people that have COVID-19 that are gonna wind up with conditions like ME-CFS. We know that. We know that you're 
you're gonna have, you see it already. You see people coming to the table and saying, well, I'm being told by my doctor that I'm better, but I am exhausted all the time. I myself can tell you, my lungs aren't quite right. I couldn't go out for a run now and feel the way I did before. Um, and you have a lot of examples of that where doctors are saying, well, it'll just take time. People need more answers than that. And when your life is passing you by day to day and you wanna be more of a contributing member of society and you wanna be able to take care of yourself and your family and you wanna just wake up and smile and laugh and not have to think about how to manage chronic disease every day, you don't feel like you have all, all the time in the world and that's not what you wanna hear when you walk into a doctor's office. So we have a fantastic panel today. I am very excited to hear what they have to say, very excited to focus on not only enlightening people as to what happens in the body with these diseases and why certain groups of people are suffering more than others, but solutions, because ultimately things aren't gonna get better unless we say, okay, this is the problem and we need to fix it. So thank you so much for having me here. And um, I hope to guide the discussion as best as I can and to tap into what I know these panelists are gonna have to say that it's gonna be extremely enlightening in the best way that I possibly can. Thank you so much. Thank you.